We are going to be reading Play Ball, written by Jorge Posada with Robert Burley, illustrated by Raul Kulan. I can't. Yes, you can. No, I can't. Yes. Get ready. Jorge crouched in the batter's box. Everything felt strange. He was batting left-handed for the first time. He squinted towards the pitcher's mound where his father waited. His father lobbed the ball. Jorge lunged awkwardly and missed. Again. The ball bounced to the backstop and rolled alongside four other balls that Jorge had swung at and missed. This is impossible. I can't do it, Papa, the boy called. I can't. Yes, you can. His father trotted down the mound to home plate. He stood behind Jorge and gently curled his arms around his son. Hold the bat this way, he said, moving Jorge's hands slightly, and bend your knees a bit more. Jorge's father stepped back. Jorge swung at the empty air. It feels weird, he complained. I'm good batting right-handed. Do I have to? Good isn't best, his father broke in, at the same time picking up the baseballs and heading back to the mound. It was early Saturday morning and Jorge and his father were the only ones on the field. Jorge's father threw and again Jorge swung and missed. On the next pitch, Jorge got a small piece of the ball. It flew upward, clanged against a crosswired top of the batting cage, and landed in the dust on a dull plop. See, his father called, you're getting the idea. It's not even in fair territory, Jorge grumbled. Then he leaned forward once more, tensed his body, and waited. Jorge thinks that it's impossible for him to learn to bat left-handed. Why do you think he believes this? Do you think it's because it's super challenging? Has there ever been a time that you found something really difficult to do? Almost to the point where you felt like it was impossible? Did you keep working at it though? And become successful? This next section takes part in another day. Splat. The hard rubber ball echoed against the concrete wall. It was Wednesday after the long bus ride home from school. Jorge wanted to do one thing, play baseball. Splat, splat. When Jorge tossed the ball high off the wall, he drifted back and caught it on the fly. When he rifled it lower, he darted left or right to scoop it up, resulting in the grounder. Jorge liked the plop sound when the ball went into the glove's wide, deep pocket. Hello, Jorge. Ernesto and Manuel walked into the vacant lot. The three friends were always together. Jorge's mother sometimes jokingly called them the three musketeers. Watch this, Jorge snarled a ground ball and underhanded it to Ernesto, who spun and flipped it to Manuel. El Pasa, what's up? Jorge walked over where his bat lay on the ground. Here's what's up, said Jorge. Jorge put the bat to his left shoulder. My dad wants me to start batting left-handed. And right, he said with a glum voice, to become a switch hitter. A switch hitter is a ball player who can um, bat both right and left-handed. Do you think that that would be a useful skill for a baseball player? Manuel gave Jorge a baffled look. That doesn't make sense. You're already a good hitter, batting righty. Ernesto broke in. No, it does make sense. Batting left hand makes it easier to hit a right-handed pitcher. I guess so, Manuel admitted. Remember that big right-handed Roberto guy that we played last week in the park? When he pitched sidearm, I thought the ball was coming smack at my head. Whoa, scary. But I didn't strike out, Jorge spoke up. Next worth thing, Manuel teased. A couple of lame taps to the pitcher? The three boys were silent. Then Jorge grinned shyly and said, Well, maybe I should practice a little left-handed. They played pepper. Ernesto and Manuel fielded. Jorge batted. His swing felt smoother, sometimes even made contact and sent a bouncing ball to one of his friends. Every chance he had, Jorge swung and swung. There were some dry bushes at the edge of the lawn in front of his house. 
Their tops came up to Jorge's waist. He crouched and swung again. He tried to just skim the tops of the bushes. He swung slowly and evenly. Then he stepped forward and swung with all of his might. He felt his wrists snap around cleanly. He spun on his heels. It felt good. More follow through, Jorge's father called out from the porch, where, unknown to Jorge, he had been watching. Jorge swung again. His father went on, let's go to the park. I'll hit you some pop-ups. Yes, Jorge shouted. He loved roaming in the field while his father lofted sky-high pop-ups that never seemed to want to come down. Let's go right now, after I take ten more cuts. Now the next section takes place on another day. His real name was Hector, but the team members called him El Flaco, the skinny one. The team was Jorge's Casa Cuba. And tall, thin Hector was the coach. Hector knew everything. He knew how a shortstop should charge a slow rolling ball and fire it submarine style at first base. He knew how an outfielder had to aim his throws at the cutoff man. Hey, Hector could even throw a mean curveball. He knew something about Jorge, too. You're good, little man, he said. And you could become very, very good if you want to. Jorge grinned. He sometimes felt as if Hector was a second father to him. Today's practice was over, but Hector was still on the mound pitching to Jorge. If the pitcher was right-handed, like Hector, a left-handed batter had a split second longer to gauge his swing. A curveball bent in toward him, too, not at his ribs, and then away. Jorge was beginning to understand what Hector meant when he said, baseball is a game of inches. Hector threw again, a slow curve. Jorge timed his swing and drove a clean line drive into center field. But ah, so you're doing it, Hector called out happily, pounding his fist into his mitt. They walked together into the outfield to pick up the batted balls. Very soon, Casa Cuba would play its arch rival, Club Capara, one of the top teams on the island. And Capara's coach was Jorge's dad. Hector looked down and smiled at Jorge. You ready for that, little man? Jorge swallowed hard. Am I? He wondered to himself. A trip to New York City. It was big. It was bigger than big. It was grande. Jorge and his little sister Michelle had never seen so many people. Hold my hand, their mother kept saying, and they did. A person could get lost here easily. They visited Chinatown. They went to the top of the Empire State Building. They strolled through Central Park, but the best was yet to come. On this day, they took the subway. When they emerged from the underground, Jorge's father pointed, look, there it is. Jorge blinked in the afternoon sunlight. Up ahead on the high concrete wall, big letters blared the name Yankee Stadium. Jorge caught his breath. Babe Ruth played here, and Mickey Mantle, and the greatest switch hitter in baseball history. In this part, Jorge and his family traveled from Puerto Rico to New York City. They followed the crowd around the curved walkway that led inside and took an escalator to the upper deck. From his seat overlooking the right field foul line, Jorge looked down. His eyes traced a path from the smooth, dark infield to the ocean of green grass to the hanging roof trim on the s up into the summer sky. There was a little flower garden behind a part of the outfield wall. His dad passed Jorge a pair of binoculars. Small monuments were in the garden. It was all so real and unreal at the same time. Jorge's father spoke softly. Their names are all there. The babe, Lou Gehrig, the others, forever. Jorge gazed at the monuments. He put the binoculars down. He paused. Someday, I'm going to play here, he announced excitedly. His mother and father smiled at each other. He will. I know he will, Michelle blurted out. Just then, the Yankees broke from their dugout. Tall Dave Winfield jogged gracefully into right. Jorge raised his binoculars again and focused. He could even see clearly the number on the uniform of his favorite player. At last, the day of the big game arrived. Play ball! It was Casa Cuba versus Club Capera. 
Lots of people were watching, which made Jorge try even harder and feel extra nervous, too. Things weren't going well, either. Pitching for Capara was, yes, the same Roberto that Jorge had batted against in the park. Jorge batted right-handed then. Now it was left, but what did it matter? First inning, strikeout on three pitches. Third inning, a weak bouncer to first. Fifth inning, another strikeout. Eighth inning, and yet another. Jorge was replaying in his mind his woeful day at the plate. When, in the top of the ninth, a simple ground ball went right through his legs, zip, a base runner scored and Capara crept ahead. Jorge wished that he could hide under the second base bag. He stood there alone with the sun beating down until the half inning ended. He trotted in, slumped onto his team's bench. The game was as good as over. How do you think Jorge is feeling right now? Do you think he feels discouraged? Have you ever had a bad day where nothing seemed to go right? What do you think when he's what do you think he's going to do when he goes up to bat this time? Let's find out. But after two quick outs, Casa Cuba's luck changed slightly. First an error, then two bases on balls. Jorge picked up his bat and walked slowly toward the batter's box. He heard his teammates calling his name. He also heard the opposing catcher chattering at the pitcher. Easy out, Roberto, easy. Jorge hesitated. He would bat right-handed this time. Enough of this switch hitting. It wasn't his idea. This is impossible. Then he remembered. He walked to the left side. If it really was a game of inches, he would take his one-inch advantage. He crouched as Roberto fired a sidearm rocket. Jorge saw the ball coming. He swung. It was only a foul tip. And yet... It felt good. Yes, you can. Roberto delivered again. Jorge swung. The bat whipped around in one complete arc as its fat part caught the ball perfectly. Jorge, already running, saw the ball zoom over the second baseman's head and higher still into the alley in right center. Go! He didn't need to slide into second base, but he did. For the sheer joy of it, he knew two runners had scored on his double. Casa Cuba had won, had won. Batso, Batso. Jorge stood up and turned to see his teammates running towards him. He looked for his father. His father wasn't running towards him, though. He was merely standing by the, cap the capara bench with his arms crossed over his chest. Then Jorge was lost in a swarm of happy, leaping bodies. In the car on the long ride home, Jorge's father was quiet. Jorge's mother asked questions about the game. Jorge's sisters piped up. He's the best. He's the best, isn't he, Papa? Jorge's father broke into smile. Well, he said, reaching over and rubbing Jorge's head. He's getting better and better, yes. Michelle went on. Can we stop for pizza? Can I choose the toppings, please? Their father chuckled. Pizza? Okay, but Jorge gets to choose tonight. He won on its two toppings, one for the right side and one for the left. So this is actually a true story. And Jorge's prediction was right. He did get to play in Yankee Stadium. Jorge tells a story about visiting Yankee Stadium in the middle of the memoir. How do you think that visiting Yankee Stadium makes him feel? What special dream does he have? So his dream is to play at Yankee Stadium. Maybe going there made him feel more comfortable and more optimistic about that dream. What do you think the author's message is in this book? Do you think it could be that no matter how hard something is, if you keep trying, it could be very rewarding? What do you think the message is?